fellow members of the Waxwork Society. <laughs> a half dozen wonders of geriatrics. <laughs> the first thing Alan did this morning was take a mustard. Uh, who knows, I think six years from now we'll be a diminishing number. But uh, the reason I left with both feet at the opportunity to participate in Nuremberg, Justice Jackson sent one of his gauleiters through London, where I happened to be doing a, a bit of a Navy court-martial work at the time, and he had an executive order that could uh, haul you in by your rear and your heels if they wanted you. So the, the, they were smart enough to know they didn't want anybody working with them who had a sullen resentment, who was a sour belly about it. They wanted someone who had a measure of enthusiasm for it. Now you can imagine if you were a school teacher, which is all I ever was or ever hoped to be. And <laughs> you were offered the opportunity to uh, participate in Nuremberg. It was, uh, it was love at first sight. I don't think one should ever make a speech, ever make a lecture, ever hold a conference, ever write a paper, unless you can write it in a way that would act like an ice pick to break up the frozen seas inside of us. That's the flame that I got out of Nuremberg. There's no time to waste. Now I know that uh, Senator Taft and other Illuminati have cursed Nuremberg as being a war crime in itself, victor's justice out to get just a, a bucket of blood. That judgment reminds me of a comment that one of my distinguished colleagues made about Senator Taft. He had the most wonderful mind in the American Senate until he made it up. <laughs> I submit that Nuremberg was more than just the idle chatter of inconsequential Prussian-type bureaucrats. I think it will last until lips are silent and tongues are dust for three solid reasons. One, it laid down with such power as international law has the proposition that aggressive war is the greatest of all crimes, in that it comprehends all the other sins and offenses that are even conceivable. If to plot and plan and carry into execution a war of aggression, with all that went with it, is not illegal, if that's not criminal, then how can we hold pickpockets and chair pushers and land developers in jail? Number two, it laid down the proposition that for individual participation in the planning, waging, and carrying out of a war of aggression, there would be individual accountability. In other words, if aggressive war comes, not only do the GIs and the corporals die, but the human beings who, in the last analysis, bear the non-delegable responsibility for planning it and waging it, the captains and the kings, the industrialists, the financiers, the bankers, the presidents, the prime ministers, the secretaries of parties, and all their cabal. Into their hands, as Justice Jackson said, we will pass the poison chalice, a rule of individual accountability. And number three, it was the first, as far as I know, post-mortem analysis of a totalitarian state. How does it come about? What are its ends and aims? How can the God-fearing, brother-loving people confront it and oppose it? One night I had to be scribbling away in the library of the American Embassy in London, and I was aware of a presence in the room. And I looked up, it was the American ambassador to the court of St. James, John Wynant, the former governor of New Hampshire. He said, what are you doing here? And I leapt to my feet, sounded off, gave my name, address, and serial number. I said, I promised my wife before I went overseas that 
if she'd shift her major from one thing to a more anointed subject, I'd help her with her term paper. And I'm scribbling away at that now, sir. He says, he says, what's your subject? I says, the strategic role and importance of the Philippine Islands. He said, it so happens I was the governor general of the Philippine Islands, and maybe we can exchange some fruitful comments about this. <laughs> and, and one of the things he said is, the lesson we're learning right now, and this is when the armies were confronting themselves between the Elbe and the Rhineland. The thing we're learning is that next time we must not wait until the sun is gleaming under bayonets. You take this dragon of totalitarianism when it's an eggshell and stamp it out and do not wait until it's altering the democracies from the menu a la carte. So I think that would be the third thing, the post-mortem analysis of a totalitarian state. Uh, another durable feeling I have about the trial was the contribution of Justice Jackson. He was not his own best PR man. In fact, he had a disdain for the concept of public relations. But this I'm satisfied in. He was a lawyer's lawyer. He was a law student's lawyer. He was a judge's lawyer. And he had, as my distinguished colleague, the brightest jewel and the Suffolk faculty crown, Justice Ben Kaplan has observed. He had vision. In fact, he had more than vision. He showed us that a trial lawyer had two things he had to have. One was he had to be a master of the microscope, and the other, a master of the telescope. You had to have the airplane view, the total view, and you had to have the worm's eye view. He did not denigrate the worm's eye view. God dwells in the details. And what he wanted to do was to write a record at Nuremberg that he could lay down for the next 1,000 years to all the seminars in graduate public law, international law, at the University of Berlin, Heidelberg, Jena, Jena, all around the world, and say, that's our record. And the submission was, it will outlast the hammers of the critics. And I submit to you that the record at Nuremberg is an anvil that will outlast the hammers of the critics until lips are silent and tongues are dust. I think of the story of the effete New Englander who was out climbing in the mountains in California. He had the advantage of an Indian guide. He had a lot of trouble. When he kept his eye on the trail before him, he didn't get lost, but he kept stumbling, fumbling, and falling all over the trail. When he kept his eye on the pole star, he didn't get lost, but he had the trouble with the trail. When he kept his eye on the trail, he didn't stumble, fumble, and fall, but he, started, he kept getting lost. And the Indian guide said, white man needs the near look and the far vision. And that's what we got to learn from Justice Jackson. He says, we are here to condemn and punish wrongs. These were delicts and crimes. We're here to punish wrongs which in their, in their calculation, these were not crimes of inadvertence or ingrained stupidity. These were planned and plotted and carried into execution. We've had despots before we had Hitler. But oh boy, the thing was, for the first time since Genghis Khan, you had the industrial urban state. You had people that knew how to be masters of the mobilized moronic mind. You had an orchestration and a deployment of all the resources of the modern state that I think made this particular challenge to the rule of law a, a unique one. In fact, one of uniquity, indeed, you might say. So we, we needed that gift of his to give us the total view and the worm's eye view, and that we had.